I thought you might be interested in a presentation on my neuroscience journey. And the main reason is that uh, the, uh, the history of neuroscience uh, began in uh, around 1900 with Ian Pavlov. Um, and of course, I'm not that old. Formal neuroscience began in 1965, when they created the, his, the Society for Neuroscience. And uh, I helped do that. In fact, I'm a charter member of the Society for Neuroscience. And uh, I, my first uh, research paper as a graduate student uh, was actually not in neuroscience. It was in uh, virology and got published in Nature. That wasn't because of any great contribution from me. It was actually because of the first author, Morris Pollard, who was famous for discovering germ-free animals. In any case, the reason I got interested in neuroscience began with the launch of Sputnik in uh, 1957 by the Russians. And it was clear that it, it was just a matter of time before everybody started building bigger rockets and that humans were going to go into orbit and maybe uh, interplanetary space. A few years before Sputnik, uh, Van Allen had discovered radiation belts surrounding the Earth. And it was obvious that humans in space flight would have to go through these radiation belts. And at the time, nobody knew much about the effects of radiation on the nervous system, except there was a presumption that the nervous system wasn't as sensitive to radiation as other tissues like the blood and so forth. So, so I wanted to find out just what effects of radiation might be on the nervous system. And I was particularly interested in uh, electrical activity and behavior. Now, I went to uh, Notre Dame to graduate school because at that time there were only two universities in the world dealing with radiation in the nervous system. One was at UCLA and, and the other was at Notre Dame. I got admitted to Notre Dame and so that's where I went. After I graduated, um, my interest in uh, brain electrical activity grew, and one of the first things that I did, which began as a graduate student actually, was develop methods for uh, stereotactically implanting electrodes in brain so that you could put uh, recording electrodes in specific parts of the brain and then evaluate what those parts of the brain, were, how they were responding electrically to uh, various situations. And my, my first book was uh, uh, actually created in, as a learning opportunity for me. <laughs> as I learned about how to do these things, I, I decided to put them together in a book called Animal Electroencephalography. And, and later on, I actually used a lot of these techniques for clinical um, neurology purposes in uh, animals. About this time in my career, I got transferred into the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine, and naturally I became uh, involved with veterinary neurology. In particular, I was um, one of the first to uh, use electroencephalography in, in animals for clinical purposes. And I uh, collaborated with a clinician, Charlie Hall, to uh, do a lot of this work. And we noticed that um, animals, dogs and cats in particular, show uh, signs of neurological disease in the EEG more or less the same way that humans do with neurological disease. Then I next became interested in the uh, ascending reticular activating system which was a continuation of my original interest in neuroscience that was spawned by Maruzzi and Magoon's discovery of the uh, 
arousal response generated in the reticular formation of the brainstem. And uh, I did studies in rats to expand on these original uh, discoveries, trying to map just where in the brainstem mild electrical stimulation will evoke uh, arousal. And in the process, I, I, I found out that it, it's more than just a waking up kind of response. It actually involves a, a constellation of behavioral and brain responses. For instance, it in, when you stimulate these uh, dark regions in the brainstem, in these black circles, uh, you elicit not only uh, uh, activation of the EEG indicating wakefulness, but you also generate increased muscle tone, both uh, rostral and caudal, to the point of stimulation. And, uh, and, and the hippocampus gets activated as well as uh, other parts of the limbic system. And we knew that uh, uh, stress hormone mechanisms are elicited by this kind of stimulation. So it led me to think of uh, a, what I would call a global readiness response that is driven uh, by a stimulation of the brainstem reticular formation. Because I had had all these years of working with electroencephalography, it was only natural that I got interested in the electrical activity of the nervous system that generates the electroencephalogram. And this is uh, summated electrical activity from uh, hundreds and thousands of neurons, which uh, uh, collectively generate the waveforms in the EEG. Uh, I was instrumental in hiring a um, young um, graduate PhD named Cliff Sherry, and uh, he worked in my lab to study uh, impulse activity in individual single neurons. And he had a, a, a novel technique shown here on the left of characterizing sequential order of the intervals between neuronal spikes. And, and there are many advantages of doing that for, for computational purposes. But, and so that's, that's why we pursued this rather than the usual way of trying to track the incidence of spikes themselves. It was their, their intervals that uh, made it convenient to evaluate sequential ordering. And we used Markov transition matrices, and maybe you're not familiar with that technique, but it is a way to show whether or not there is sequential dependency, whether or not a, a series of events are random and independent, or whether there is built-in non-random order. And when we did that, we discovered that um, under uh, many conditions, certain um, spike trains from single neurons are not random. Their intervals are sequentially ordered and uh, clustered in, in groups of as many as five to six adjacent intervals. And I call, I referred to this as byte processing. And uh, to this day, it's still a viable concept, although it, it, I have to admit it hasn't caught on in neuroscience circles. About this time, I also got interested in uh, studying uh, drugs that affect the nervous system, in particular opiates and alcohol. And the alcohol work turned out to be the most significant. Uh, my lab discovered that uh, alcohol acts by um, binding to the phospholipids, uh, in particular um, the, uh, in the areas of the sialic acid residues in, in membrane uh, gangliosides. Gangliosides are a class of, of uh, lipids that uh, are concentrated in the nervous system, and in particular in the synapses. And they cluster around uh, uh, synaptic proteins that are embedded in, in nerve membrane. 
and they obviously can uh, ha have the capacity, therefore, to cause allosteric effects on these receptor proteins that influence whether the ion channels are open or closed. In any case, our, our discoveries uh, were that uh, the alcohol binding in these regions uh, in the surface of membranes causes allosteric effects in certain receptors and changes their, their ion channel gating, of course, and, and that's the ultimate explanation for why alcohol is intoxicating. Uh, here, this diagram up here shows where alcohol binds in phospholipids. These are phospholipids in the electric charge groups. And the, and the discovery we made was that alcohol displaces hydrogen bonded water in this, in this region. Now, I've always been interested in learning and memory as a student, and uh, that led me to get involved in, in studying memory. And my, my first memory studies uh, in, involved uh, the role of sex hormones in both males and females. And it turns out that both uh, estrogen and testosterone promote memory formation. And when I say memory formation, I mean the, the consolidation of temporary memory into more lasting memory. And this led to a, a more practical applications about what students and learners can do to promote memory consolidation. And I even recently wrote a book for parents and teachers showing them the kinds of things they can do to help their children become better learners. Uh, by the way, I currently have a blog site on improving learning and memory, which, uh, which has over three and a half million reader views at Psychology Today, which is the uh, journal where I, I publish these blog posts. Because of my different experiences with uh, memory and memory consolidation research, I was also interested in the more general idea that neuroscience can contribute to improving learning as well as memory. And uh, so I began to apply some of the findings about how the brain learns things and remembers things to uh, teaching and wrote uh, several papers as well as this textbook on core ideas in neuroscience. Incidentally, I have created a LinkedIn group on neuroeducation and uh, hundreds of people now participate in this, this group devoted to using neuroscience to improve educational practices. Early on in my career, I'd, I'd gotten interested in animal hypnosis, or at least that's what it was called back in those days. I subsequently have evolved my thinking to think of it in terms of behavioral arrest. Uh, and here, here's some illustrations of, of how you demonstrate that in uh, highly susceptible species like frogs and rabbits. But, but it's related also to catalepsy, which is a uh, disease that occurs in humans. In the early days, I had a major competitor named uh, Gordon Gallup. Maybe you've heard of him because he became famous for discovering that uh, monkeys recognize themselves in a mirror. And uh, he and I, in these early days, were competitors in this field of animal hypnosis. Gordon believed, as a psychologist that he was, that uh, animal hypnosis was a fear response. Well, I demonstrated in, by making transections in the brain of living animals that you could transect uh, the brain and provide good nursing support to the animal such that the animal could still be induced into this animal hypnotic state when the transaction was 
behind the parts of the brain that regulate emotions, in particular fear. In other words, you can produce animal hypnosis in an animal that's incapable of fear. And as a consequence, I, I concluded that what we're dealing with here is a complex reflex system driven out of circuitry in the brainstem that descends to motor neurons in the spinal cord to induce this, uh, this paralysis that you see. Uh, about this time, I also uh, was uh, active in a, in a vision research lab with the Air Force. In fact, I was a reserve officer in, in the Air Force, and my reserve duty involved research in the vision research laboratory, which was studying steady state visual evoke responses in anesthetized monkeys. And, and then we also progressed to doing it in humans. And um, the um, interesting study in uh, monkeys was that even though they were anesthetized, their visual cortex was processing visual stimulus. And we, we saw that in the electrically evoked uh, responses to uh, visual stimuli. Uh, which were, were were actually checkerboard patterns of black and white, and the beauty of that was that uh, you could you, you had absolute control over the nature of the stimulus, and you could vary the spatial frequency and the uh, and the contrast, so that you, you, it was a very robust way to test visual processing. When when I progressed to studying this in humans, I, I dis discovered that. Even though the visual stimulus was going to both hemispheres, the response was lateralized and, and also correlated with uh, handedness. Uh, and that, moreover, some subjects were vastly different in the degree of hemispheric lateralization of the evoked response, as much as 17-fold differences. Now, we, we thought perhaps this would have a great uh, impact on fighter pilots in their visual responses, which at the time, uh, people selected their fighter pilots in terms of having 20-20 uh, or 20-15 visual acuity. But it turns out the more important feature of vision is spatial contrast and uh, f frequency uh, response. In the late 1980s, I had a Canadian graduate student who wanted to work with me, and his interest was on uh, pheromones, sexual pheromones, which are chemicals released by female animals that, during uh, the state of estrus. And, uh, and shown here in upper left is a picture of a bull responding to urine from an estrus cow. And you notice the tongue position of that bull. He's actually stroking the ducts in the roof of his mouth that, to help uh, bring the chemicals in that urine into his uh, vomeral nasal organ, which is uh, a sensory organ in the uh, no nasal cavity. Well, in any case, uh, Germain Rivard, uh, discovered that using gas chromatography, and an example is shown up here in the upper right, that uh, certain body fluids, in particular uh, urine and, and milk and a few other fluids, contain the estrus pheromone. And so we tried to discover the chemistry of this pheromone. And in particular, a, a Chinese graduate student we Dong Ma collaborated with me, and we did uh, many gas chromatography studies on cows and also horses, uh, trying to discover the uh, estrus pheromone. What we did discover was that acetyl that acid aldehyde increases in body fluids at the time and just before the onset of estrus. So we hoped that to discover that acetaldehyde was a pheromone. It turns out, apparently, it is not a pheromone. It just coincidentally is a marker 
for uh, estrus. And in fact, we have several worldwide patents on that uh, discovery. But uh, practical matters is that acid aldehyde is so chemically reactive that we were not able to develop a practical field uh, test for acid aldehyde in, uh, in urine. One of the uh, strangest aspects of my career in neuroscience involves studies in sleep. And, and I say strange because one of the first studies I ever did was uh, on sleep in, in goats. And I then left that subject for decades and only recently have come back to it uh, for, in a different context. But, but in any case, uh, back in the 60s when I was uh, studying sleep in ruminants, it was widely believed that ruminants don't sleep. In fact, don't dare sleep because they would drown on their cud, you know, chewing their cud. Well, recording from these goats, I noticed that uh, there were periods the EEG would uh, uh, become activated when they were behaviorally asleep, and that's, of course, a signal of dream sleep. And, and what I saw was that rumen activity was virtually shut down when they were in sleep state. In this upper left, the um, EEG uh, indicates a lot of artifact with, with the chewing motions when they're awake, and then they fall asleep and, and go into dream sleep, and the rumen activity is, is shut down. So they can dream and sleep because their rumen shuts down and they don't run any danger of... Uh, drowning in their own cud. Incidentally, uh, I thought I had been the first in the world to discover this. It turns out six months earlier, a Frenchman named Michael Jovet had discovered the same thing in sheep. And my work was done in goats, but they're both ruminants, of course. And he later became vastly more famous than I did because he, he stayed in the sleep research field and made many other, other discoveries. This also relates, uh, as shown up here in the upper right, to, to the later work I did with arousal, which is, of course, the opposite of sleep. And, and I constructed this uh, diagrammatic scheme for how uh, stimulus, excitatory stimulus operates in the spinal cord and brainstem to regenerate uh, this... Uh, arousal response and the uh, what, what I call the readiness, behavioral readiness response. Uh, I did come back to briefly study sleep in uh, the armadillo, in, in part because I had him running around in my field and I was interested in sleep. And armadillo is a very primitive animal, primitive mammal, and uh, and there's always been a lot of interest in the neuroscience community about the evolution of sleep. And the question arose is, do these very primitive animals exhibit uh, sleep? And also, do they show signs of dream sleep? And it appears that the armadillo does. It's, it's very primitive. It's in rudimentary. But, it, but all the electrographic signs of sleep and dream sleep do occur in the armadillo. Recently, uh, I, after many years of ignoring the subject of sleep, I came back to the to the issue of uh, why do we have dream sleep, or also called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, and it could because it, it it doesn't seem to have any point to it except maybe for the psychological reasons, and in fact, beginning with Freud and Jung and others. That were, who thought that the whole point of dream sleep was psycho, psychological uh, influence uh, on uh, generated by the brain. Well, I conceived of another uh, explanation, in part because of my physiological studies on arousal, uh, because dream sleep is an arousing situation. The brain becomes active just like it does when you're awake. And, and I thought about that and, and wondered if maybe the whole point 
of dream sleep is to wake you up. Maybe it's the brain's way of telling itself that you've had enough sleep, it's time to wake up and get on with the, the business of living. In any, in any case, uh, that's this is the idea that I came up with, and 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 I can defend it on uh, multiple grounds, which we don't have time to go into here, of course. In the last few years, I've become interested in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, although I, in early years, I I was. Uh, studying what generally is called behavioral neuroscience, in, in when, especially when I was studying uh, animal hypnosis. And, and the field of neuroscience has involved from uh, the early days where uh, investigators thought everything could be explained in terms of conditioning and, and that the um, the idea that the brain thinks and then the thoughts control behavior uh, is is a myth. Well, in that connection, uh, there was a study, there were a series of studies back in the 80s by others that uh, were interpreted to indicate that people did not have free will. In other words, all their behavior is not generated by thought, but is generated by uh, external stimuli and and things of that sort that, that in fact you don't even have conscious agency so you certainly couldn't have free will well this irritated me on philosophic grounds so I started studying these research papers and recognized that there were many flaws in these papers experimental methodological flaws and interpretive flaws reasoning errors and I wasn't the only one to, to draw this conclusion. A lot of other neuroscientists uh, had the same conclusion. And so the community of neuroscientists are sort of split on this issue. Well, in any case, I decided to write this book about, to make the case for conscious agency and free will in uh, contradiction of the, this other view that there is no such thing as free will. Well, also at the uh, in these same years, I, I did what was, I thought was a very interesting study on uh, ambiguous figures and uh, and how the brain thinks about ambiguous figures. And if you look up here in the upper left, you see that uh, there are different kinds of ambiguous figures, and and in the figures like this, there are two percepts. Uh, for instance, you can see this one on the upper left, either as a man's face or, or a naked lady. And, and every person, when they look at a figure like this, has the default percept and does not immediately perceive the alternative. I became interested in, in what is the brain doing when, when it switches percept? from, for instance, recognizing a man's face and, and a sudden eureka phenomenon, oh, this looks like a naked lady. And, and, and so I recorded brain waves, electroencephalograms from humans as they looked at these different figures. And I had them look at 10 different figures and record uh, the brain activity uh, over multiple scalp sites as they uh, switched percept and at the instant of percept they would press a button and that told me uh, when they had had this cognitive switch when I when we analyzed the signals in terms of their frequency content and their spatial distribution in the uh, on the scalp we, we found that across all frequency bands from slow waves to fast waves and we could filter the signal in selectively look at different frequencies. There was an enormous uh, synchrony developed across multiple scalp sites uh, at this instant of Eureka, you know, when they suddenly had this uh, realization of an alternative percept. And, uh, and so this, this tells us that maybe conscious perception has something to do with frequency and spatial coherence, uh, that, that maybe this is the brain's way of binding thought in different parts of the brain to produce a cohesive 
perception of complex stimuli. In any case, uh, the, the, this whole idea of binding is not unique to me. And other people thought of it before I did. But it, it does seem that uh, this is indicated by frequency coherence of brain waves um, on different regions of the brain. And so this uh, leads to many interesting questions about how different parts of the brain coordinate to produce perception and, and thought. My current interest in neuroscience is in a subject you might not think scientists would pursue, and that is the relationship of the science to theology. It's common uh, feeling that uh, the more educated one becomes, the least religious they become. And uh, to test this idea that I, I, with a um, couple of colleagues, conducted a large survey of students at Texas A&M University uh, evaluating the relationship between how much education they had in college, whether they were freshmen, sophomores, seniors, and so on, or their academic major, whether it was science or, or a liberal arts major, on their religious beliefs and practices. And this yielded a very interesting uh, result indicating uh, several, several things. One, one is that Aggies are different from a lot of college students. All the other studies have occurred in uh, universities of a different culture than is found at Texas A&M. Uh, another thing we found, however, is that uh, college education, at, at Texas A&M at least, uh, actually promotes religious belief, even though this is a secular uh, university. Now, in some students, it has the opposite effect, but, but large percentages of students become more religious uh, through their Texas A&M experience. Well, the other aspect of neurotheology that I've pursued is based on work that uh, others have done using brain imaging. In their studies, in fact, they use brain scans to create this field of neurotheology in which they found that when you are praying or, or having some kind of religious experience, certain parts of the brain become selectively active. And so, and so they, people would call these parts of the brain God spots. Now this uh, kind of research has sort of reached what I think is a dead end. I mean, it, Part of the problem is that these parts of the brain that process religious thought also process other kinds of thought that have nothing to do with neurotheology. So, so I'm becoming interested in a different question, and namely that is, uh, how does the brain allocate neural resources for different kinds of thought? And, and it spawned this uh, paper that you see here titled Neuro with their neurotheology. And the idea is, that, in at least my opinion, this field isn't going to go anywhere until we find other ways to exploit the, the whole concept of relationship between neuroscience and theology. And in particular, I take the position that neuroscience has made many discoveries that could be useful in counseling, religious counseling. And it has led me to create this book called Triune Brain, Triune Mind, and Triune Worldview. Triune Brain refers to the idea that there's a mammalian brain and a reptilian brain and a fish brain uh, in terms of anatomy and physiology. Triune Mind refers to the fact that we have a conscious mind, a subconscious mind, and a non-conscious mind, non-conscious being those uh, parts in the brain stem and spinal cord that have no possibility of ever supporting consciousness on their own. And triune world view refers to the relationships of neuroscience, mental health, and religion. Now, I don't know that this is going to be the end of my interest areas in neuroscience because I think you've seen now
that for whatever reason, I tend to get interested in lots of different aspects of neuroscience. But in any case, it's been a very uh, exciting and stimulating ride, and I'm not sure I would have done things I would do things much differently if I could start all over again. Well, thank you for uh, taking the time to review this past with me.